I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter th- uh, 1 is where we're going to be at, verses 3 through 5 this morning. And uh, this is such a great passage. We're, we've been walking slowly. We're going to continue to walk slowly. Uh, verses 3 through 12 is kind of all one section, but we'll, we'll cover it in a few weeks as we go through it. Um, I, I'm not sure if you realize this yet, but uh, there's, there's an election that's happening in 23 days. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about that. And, uh, and I hope, I hope as believers, I hope you'll participate. I hope if you're of an age to vote that you will vote. That is a great privilege that we have been given uh, as uh, citizens of the United States, that we have the ability to speak into who our leaders are. And so I hope that you take that opportunity to do that. I hope you prayerfully think through that uh, and that you uh, vote based upon your conscience and based upon what you feel the Lord is calling you to do. This election is significant. Uh, It will have significant implications. It will have real world implications. Whoever takes power well, it will have real world implications for all of us, and there's no question about that. But what I've seen is that some people are placing all of their hope in this election. They're believing that there's, that there's an existential threat to the life as we know it, and that all of our hope is based upon what happens in 23 days. And I want you to know that God's word would remind us this morning that as followers of Jesus Christ, that we have a hope far greater than any election. We have a hope that is far greater than any president or any senate or any legislative branch. Governments will come and go, but this hope will never change. And that is the message that God has for us this morning. I can understand for those who have, uh, whose who's all their hope is placed in the election, who, ha- who don't know God, who don't know the God of the Bible, that they don't know that there is a God who is sovereign over the universe, who is sovereign over the nations, who rules and who reigns, and who is at work bringing about a plan of redemption that he has created from the very beginning. I can understand why somebody would be anxious and why somebody would not have, have hope with everything that's going on in the world right now. But for those of us that are in Christ, for those of us that know the Lord God, we know that our God reigns. We know that he rules and that everything is under his hand. And so we don't need to be anxious. We have a hope that is greater than anything else. We have a hope that cannot change. It will not change in 23 days. It will not change in 23 years. It will not change until we go home to be with the Lord or until he comes again to bring us home. It is a hope that is unshaken, unchangeable. And that's what the believers in the early church needed to be reminded of as they suffered under persecution for their hope and their faith in Jesus Christ. Peter needed to remind them that their hope was not in this world. And we need to be reminded of the same thing this morning. These believers, they would, they would possibly lose everything when they came to follow Jesus. They could lose their property. They could lose their wealth. They could lose their family. They could even lose their very life. But there was something that could never be taken away from them. And that was this hope in Jesus Christ. And Peter, call, Peter writes to remind them of that reality, and he, he writes to remind us of that, re, that very reality as well. And so let's look at that together. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, even just as we read these words, God, our hearts are rested in who you are and what you are doing. Lord, we pray that as we study this verse, as we look at it in depth, God, that that that, uh, hope in us, Lord, would be even uh, strengthened, God, that we would have an even greater understanding of all that you have given us in Christ Jesus. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you would teach us now from your word, that your spirit would lead us and guide us and would uh, encourage us where we need to be comforted, would convict us where we need to be convicted, and, Lord, would empower us to be able to live the life that you've called us to live as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, those that are redeemed, those that are his bride, waiting for him to come to take us home. And so, Lord, teach us now from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we started out this book together. We looked at the introduction. We saw that this, this letter was written by the Apostle Peter. It was written for the churches that were kind of scattered all around in Asia Minor. And he writes to encourage them in the midst of persecution that they're facing. And he reminds them of their primary identity. And he uses two words, if you remember. First of all, he says, you're exiles. You're not where you belong. You're not in, in the homeland, speaking of the spiritual homeland that you will one day be in. He reminds them that in this world, they will suffer. That's the reality of this world. But he also reminds them that they're not just exiles, but they are elect exiles. And he talks to them about how the fact that they are followers of Jesus, that God before the foundations of the world had planned out the plan for their salvation, that the Holy Spirit had sanctified them, and that they were saved for the purpose of obeying and having relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you were greatly encouraged last week as we saw that introduction. And if that wasn't enough for us to rejoice in, to give thanks for, to praise God for, well, Peter just keeps going, and he gives us even more reasons why we should rejoice in the Lord this morning. And in verses 3 through 12, there is one gigantic long praise that Peter makes about this great God that we worship. Uh, in, and in verses 3 through 5, which is what we're going to look at this morning, he gives us one of those reasons. And the primary reason that, that uh, peppers all throughout verses 3 through 5 is the idea that we have been, by God's grace, born again. If we have no other reason to praise, if we have no other reason to rejoice in the midst of our suffering and our circumstances, we always have a reason to give thanks, and that is because we have been born again. We have been born of the Spirit. We have been made a new creation in Jesus Christ. And so Peter explains that. Look at verse 3 with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now he starts out with this adjective, blessed. And it describes somebody or something that is worthy of praise, worthy of blessing. And he, and he, and he starts out because he's directing their focus and attention to thanksgiving and to praise. He's reminding them, as he will throughout the rest of the book, that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what suffering we endure, we always have, give, we always have reason to give thanks. And as believers, we must remember that. And this blessing, this praise that he is ascribing is to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the one that he is blessing or praising. This is the God of the Bible, right? The triune God. This is the only God that is triune. And, and we see the first uh, two members of the Trinity there. And last week we saw the, all three members of the Trinity. This is the God of the Bible, right? The, the God who sent the Son into the world to die for our sins, to redeem us from the wrath that we deserved, to give us eternal life and a living Hope. This is the God that he, uh, that he praises because this God is the God that is alone worthy of our praise. And one of the reasons he's worthy of our praise, Peter says, is because according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Because of God's great mercy. Now this word mercy uh, in the English, you know, we understand it means getting what we, we don't deserve in a sense. But in the, in the uh, original language, not, not just the Greek, but actually in the Hebrew, this, this word is translated in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And it's the same word that is then in the Hebrew is the word chesed. And if you've been a believer, perhaps you've heard that word before because it is so common in the Old Testament. It is the covenant name of 
or love of God in the Old Testament. It is the word that God uses to describe who he is to his people. And it's the word that means, I, it, means it means covenant, faithful love. It speaks to this unique covenant relationship that God made with his people. We talked about it a little bit last week. Now, some people picture the God of the Old Testament, and they picture him as being angry and wrathful and vengeful. And then they think the God of the New Testament is this God of mercy and grace and love. But when you understand the scriptures and when you understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, how they connect together through Jesus Christ, you realize that that the reality is, that's not the reality at all, that God is always a God of mercy. He's always a God of grace. In the Old Testament, when when God revealed who he was to his children, to his people, uh, to Moses specifically, in Exodus 34, 6, Moses said, Lord, tell me who you are. Show me who you are. And as, as God revealed himself to Moses, he said this, the Lord passed before him and he proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in chesed, in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is the character of our God and the ultimate expression of this covenant faithful, merciful love was the sending of of his son, of Jesus Christ, who would come and purchase us back to the Father, who would die in our place for our sins so that we would not have to face the wrath of God. This is the mercy of God that Peter is rejoicing in and is calling us to remember that through that mercy, He caused us to be born again. Now, born again is a common way that many people talk about conversion or salvation. What's interesting, though, is that the only place that this exact verb is used in the New Testament is here and in 1 Peter 1.23. In 1 Peter 1.23, Peter says, Since you have been born again, the same word, anaganao, not a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. He says, you have been born again through faith that you received when the gospel came upon you and you believed in the gospel, you were born again. It's the only place the other the word is used, but the concept is used in another place. It's probably the place that Peter is thinking about. It's probably the place that you're thinking about as well. That where is born again used, it's used in John chapter three by Jesus himself. Jesus, speaking to Nicodemus, tells Nicodemus that to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And here we know that Jesus is speaking to this new birth that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of a believer. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, when they have faith in Jesus Christ, it is a work of the Spirit of God who brings new life into a person's life. We call this regeneration. We call this, this is the act of conversion, right? When somebody comes to faith and believes in Jesus Christ. Now, John, uh, Jesus explains it in verse 6 through 8 of John chapter 3. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, for the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus here is speaking to the grace of God. That is God's grace by the work of the Spirit that somebody is born again. And somebody must be born again. They must have spiritual faith to be a follower of Jesus, and this is what we are to rejoice in. This mercy that God has given us, that our salvation is not because of what we have done, it's not because of the work that we have accomplished, it's not because of how great we are, it is because of the mercy and of the grace of our great God and Father through the work of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the work of the Spirit of God. And friends, this is, this is the reason we have 
reason to rejoice in any and all circumstances is because we have been born again. Now the question I have for you this morning is have you been born again? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? If you're here this morning and you have not yet done that, you have not called out on the Lord for salvation, I want to invite you this morning to make this day a day where you do that. I'll be around afterwards. I would love to talk to you. If you want to talk to somebody and know what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, I would love to do that. There are others in this room that would love to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But I don't leave today until you know that you have the hope that Peter is talking about, the hope that is found in Christ alone. You need to call out to the Lord. Acknowledge yourself as one who needs God, a sinner in need of God's grace. You need to believe that Jesus died for you, for your sins. You need to believe that he rose from the grave. And you need to confess him as Lord and call out to him as Lord. And if you do, the Bible says that you will be saved, not just now, but eternally. And that's what Paul, or sorry, that's what Peter is talking about. That's what our hope is in. It is in our salvation. And Peter gives praise to God because of this salvation. And look what he says. He says, he caused us to be born again. This references back to what we saw in the first few verses, that God is the author of our salvation. He, it is only by his grace that we come to faith in Christ. This word caused, it implies that it was solely on the part of God in his work that we were given new life. It is by his grace that we are saved. And this is the reason that, that he deserves our praise. Not only that he made a way of salvation, but he, he brought us to salvation. It is by his grace that we have been saved, that we have been rescued from his wrath. This is why Paul says in Ephesians 2, 2, through, uh, 2 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Friends, no matter what circumstances you face in life, this is a reality that cannot be changed. You have every reason to give praise and to give thanks because Jesus Christ has saved you because he has redeemed you from the wrath that you and I deserved. And instead of getting what we justly deserve, the Lord has given us what we never deserved. That is his mercy and his grace and everlasting life. And so we have every reason to rejoice. And Peter continues on, right? He continues on that that's the, the reality that we have been born again now has ongoing results, and there are three results that he highlights for us in this passage. Three results that should, should give us uh, things to rejoice in. And so what are they? Well, first of all, we see we are to rejoice in our living hope. We are to rejoice in our living hope. Now, the opposite of living is, of course, to be dead. And that is the reality of what all hope is outside of Christ where it might seem like there's something there. In reality, there's nothing that brings hope other than Christ. Hope in elections is a dead hope. Hope in your bank account is a dead hope. Hope in earthly relationships that they're going to somehow fulfill you is a dead hope. All hope outside of Christ, trying to find life outside of the hope in Christ will ultimately lead to only uh, emptiness and in reality, death. And unfortunately, in ultimate reality, eternal death. If someone never turns to Christ, that hope is a dead hope. It's as foolish as the Israelites who turned away from a living God to worship stones and rocks and idols. It's easy for us to look at uh, the Old Testament and for us to say, man, what are those foolish Israelites? 
I mean, God redeemed them. God pulled them out of Egypt. He fed them in the wilderness. He parted the Red Sea for them. He gave them everything. How could they have abandoned him and turned to rocks and stones and bales and asherahs? The reality is, friends, we're just as foolish. We turn from the living God who has given us life. We turn to the things of this world and power and possessions and earthly relationships, thinking that these things will somehow give us life. And maybe for a moment, they give us happiness. Maybe for a moment, the next purchase you make will will bring you a a great joy for the moment, but eventually you'll realize that that thing is gonna break down. It's gonna cost you even more, and it's not gonna bring you any hope. That great big house you bought, eventually it's, it's not gonna feel sufficient enough, or the great promotion you got is just not gonna be enough. You see, everything else is a dead hope. It, it leads to emptiness, but, but there is a cup that overflows with life and never runs out. And it is the living hope of the living God. And so why would we turn to other things? And Peter reminds us this morning, he reminds these believers that may even die for their faith, that though their lives may be taken, they have a living hope that can never be taken away. They have a living hope because they have a living God. And of course, Peter here is connecting this to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look what he says next. Through, you have this living hope through or by means of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The reason our hope is a living hope is because our God is a living God. He's no longer in the grave. By his resurrection, he demonstrated his power over sin, his power over death. And he promised that that those of us that are in Christ, that as we go into the grave, one day we will be risen again. Our spirits will be reunited. Our bodies will be made new. And we will be with our Lord forever and ever and ever. This is the living hope that he promises, and this is the living hope that we have been given. Friends, that's why we have a living hope. Our hope is not in this world. It is not in the promises of this world or in the failed promises of this world. It is in the promises of our everlasting, eternal God, our Savior who has gone before us and who is coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. And nothing, nothing can take that away. And so let me ask you this morning, what is your hope in? What are you resting in? What are you investing your life in? And what are you holding on to? This is the only hope that will last. And so we rejoice because we have been given a living hope through Christ. But he goes on. If that's not enough, he goes on. He says, you not only have been given a living hope, but you have been given an eternal inheritance. And so rejoice in your eternal inheritance. Rejoice in your eternal inheritance. Verse 4, you have been given uh, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This again is going back, it's connecting to the the main idea, which is being born again. You have been born again to an inheritance. Now, an inheritance in the ancient world was significant. It was a person's sense of of wealth, a person's sense of worth. Uh, It was the name that they held, and it would be passed on from generation to generation. But when people would become followers of Jesus Christ, even like sometimes today in the world and in other parts of the country, when, uh, sorry, other parts of the world and in, in uh, places where Islam and other places reign, when somebody becomes a Christian, they lose everything. They lose their land. They lose their wealth. Sometimes they lose their family. And sometimes they even lose their own life. And that was the reality of what would take place in, in, the, in, the early, in the first century that Peter is writing to. Some of these believers were losing everything. And so Peter reminds them that they have something that cannot be taken away. While they might lose their land, they may even lose their life, they cannot lose this eternal inheritance. 
And he, he gives three descriptive adjectives to build upon this and to tell us what kind of inheritance we have, been, what we have received. And so the first is, you, we have been given an imperishable inheritance. An imperishable inheritance. Now, the word imperishable means not subject to decay or to death. It is untouched by death. And so while they might be killed, while, while they might lose their life, they have an inheritance that in Christ that was immortal, that could never be touched by death. Friends, you realize that no matter what you lose in this life, there's one thing that can never be taken away, and it is the grace that you have been given in Jesus Christ through salvation to be born again. It is an imperishable inheritance. You've also been given an undefiled inheritance, an undefiled inheritance. Now, undefiled means to, to not be defiled. Well, what does that mean? It means to not be defiled by sin or uh, it has moral implications. You could say it this way. It is to be untouched by evil. Now, everything in our world right now is touched by sin. All of our relationships, our work, uh, our money, just everything in our world is broken and touched by sin. But Peter is reminding these believers that one day, that one day they will be in a place where it will no longer be affected by sin. This is the hope of those that are followers of Jesus Christ. That one day there will be no more tears, no more viruses, no more death. There will be no more suffering and no more sorrow. There will only be the everlasting joy of Jesus Christ. Now these believers, they were facing suffering and they were facing death and, and they were being defiled by sin and they were being defiled by sinful people that were, 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 were persecuting them. But Peter reminds them that they have an eternal inheritance that will never be defiled. It is unstained. The third thing we see is that we have been given an unfading inheritance. You can see how these build all upon one another. They all, they all reflect the same thing and build upon the same thing. This is an unfading inheritance. The word unfading means to, to not lose its wonder, to never lose its pristine character. It is untouched by time. It never fades. You see, this inheritance only gets better, not worse. Everything else in this world that we have, it all decays. It all falls apart. It all breaks because it's all affected by a broken, sinful world. But we will be given an inheritance for eternity that never fades. It never changes. It will be greater every single day. It will be greater than anything that you can imagine in this broken world. You know, there's some great things in this world. There's great joy that we find in our family. There's great joy that we find in our recreation. There's great joy that we find, you know, on our vacation and work and all those things. But you know what? None of those are comparable. None of those are comparable to the unfading joy that will be found and is found in Christ Jesus. It's better than any possession better than any earthly relationship, better than any achievement, and it will be eternally unfading. Peter reminds them, he reminds us this morning that we have been given an eternal inheritance. Now perhaps Peter is thinking about another great sermon that he heard from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It probably shook his world, made him think in new ways. Matthew 6 19 through 21, Jesus said, earth-shattering things. He said to them, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We need to ask ourselves, what are we investing in? What are we investing our time, our money, our talents, 
what are we investing in? Are we investing in the broken things of this world that really have no return, that ultimately just decay and die? Are we investing in things that are eternal, in relationships, in the body, in, in, in helping people come to faith in Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of God? Are we investing in things that actually matter? This is what Peter reminds them of, that they, are, they have an inheritance that is unfading, unperish, uh, un, un, uh, that never perishes, never fades. It's unstained by sin. It's eternal, and it's kept in heaven for us. Now, the third outcome of our salvation that Peter rejoices in is rejoice in your secured salvation. Rejoice in your secured salvation. Now, this section concludes with one of the greatest promises that we can hold on to and that we have been given. And it says this, at the end of verse 4, it says, This treasure has been kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This, This treasure, this eternal inheritance, it is kept or reserved in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven and, and it's kept by God himself. Now, there are, there, there's something called a divine passive verb, and there's a bunch of them in this last part. And a divine passive is something where you don't do the action. You are acted upon, and here you are acted upon by God. And so Peter's point is that God is the one doing all of this. You're just a bystander, really, in reality. God is the one doing this, and, and God is keeping, first of all, keeping our salvation is kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven far beyond the events of this world, far beyond the elections, far beyond the suffering, far beyond anything that could happen in this world. Yours and my salvation is kept in heaven. And who is it kept by? It's kept by God. He, it is kept by God's power, Peter says. He uses the strongest possible terms to describe how secure our salvation is in Christ. It is kept and guarded. Now, whenever a word is repeated that has the same meaning, you can understand that there, the author is trying to emphasize this reality. And here, that's exactly what he's doing. He's emphasizing the fact that God himself is guarding our salvation. It is guarded by God. The word guard means to hold prisoner or to guard, to keep watch over. And Peter is saying that your salvation is in heaven under maximum security and it's guarded by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So what, what, what can take that away? What can steal that away? The answer is nothing. Romans 8, 31 through 39, Paul says this to the church of Rome. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Then who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Friends, these verses have brought hope to believers that have suffered and died for their faith. They can bring hope to us who are under challenges and suffering, but nowhere near the kind that other brothers and sisters in the world right now are facing. And how does he guard our salvation? How does God keep and guard our salvation? Well, Peter answers. He says, through faith, by means of faith. God perseveres our faith. So it is by his grace that not only we come to faith and salvation, but it is by his grace that we are preserved or persevere in our salvation. This is the doctrine known as the perseverance of the saints. That those who God draws to himself are those that God perseveres all the way to the very end. We are not saved because of our work or because of our effort or because of how good we are. We are saved because of God's grace persevering in us. And here he says, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, in the eschaton, right? The salvation here. Now, when we think of salvation, we think of uh, spiritual, that we, are, that we are saved. When we trust in Christ, we are saved. And that is true. We are saved. But we are saved for a future time. And here, Paul, uh, Peter is pointing out that we are saved. The word saved means to deliver or to rescue. And that one day we will be ultimately delivered. We will be ultimately rescued. Rescued from what? Rescued from the judgment of God that we deserve for our sin. Because of our faith in Christ, we will be rescued or saved from the wrath that we deserve. This is the idea that Peter is talking about. He's talking about the final judgment. When Jesus comes back to rule and to reign, when the great white throne judgment occurs, and that all of men and women, all of their lives are laid bare, and if they have placed their trust and faith in Christ, their sin is atoned for. If they have not placed their faith and trust in Christ, they will face the just wrath of a just God. And Peter says, you who are in Christ, that you are saved. You will be delivered from that day, ready to be revealed in the last time. Who is the one that reveals? Again, this is a divine passive verb. It is God who will reveal in the last time. The preservation of our faith will reveal that we are genuine followers of Jesus Christ in the final judgment and at the final reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will not be because of your effort. It will not be because of your work. It will be because of God's grace in your life. That God will persevere you to the end. Now, he will do that through faith. So it will be by means of, of his grace that he shows through your continued obedience and through your continued faith until the very end. But your faith and obedience will not, become, not come from you. It will come through the faith that God grants you, the mercy that he gives. And so what do we need to do? We need to draw near to Jesus we need to draw near to the, the, the church that he has given us to encourage us and to strengthen us in our faith. We need to be in his word, reminded daily of who he is and what he has done. And through, through that faith that he gives us, that is strengthened by the word and by the spirit and by the church, through that faith he perseveres us to the very end. And friends, that's why we are able to rejoice in any and all circumstances that we might face. That's why as followers of Jesus that we have hope in a world that it seems to have no hope at all. Because our hope is not dependent on politics. It's not dependent upon viruses. It's not dependent upon anything in this broken world. It is based upon our eternal, living, resurrected Savior and the promises that he has given us. You have been born again to a living hope, to an eternal inheritance, and to a secured salvation. 
That's what the suffering believers needed to hear in the first century. That is what you and I need to hear every day. We need to be reminded where our true hope is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this encouragement from your word. Thank you for this correction in our lives, for this reminder, God, of where our true and everlasting hope is. Father, we pray that you would help us in the days to come, that we would not be anxious. Father, that we would uh, be confident in you. And Lord, that we would be a light in the midst of darkness. And God, that we would walk by faith, and regardless of what happens in the elections, Lord, that we would walk by faith as those that love you and serve you, that we would continue to, to walk as light, that we would continue to walk as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, that we would share the good news of the gospel, that we would point people to Jesus, and that we would show them that there is a greater hope than anything on this world and is found in the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, would you help us to do that? Would you strengthen us for that task? Thank you for the body of Christ that helps us to do that, that we don't have to do that alone. We, we do that as a family on mission for your glory. And so we praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.